Today in NPTEL experimental biochemistry course, we will learn how to isolate and characterize a protein. So if you are working in a biochemistry lab, you will might find out that uh, you need to have some protein for your own experiment and uh, today we will learn how to isolate that particular protein. So for today's experiment, we will go through the basic steps of protein purification from a source. So there is no hard and fast uh, one single technique how you can isolate a particular protein. So depending on the protein, you need to change or modify the protocol a little bit, but mostly the basic principle will be same. So first we need to uh, have the source of that particular protein. So if you are using a bacteria, it is a very good source to get a large amount of protein because you can grow a bacteria in a large culture and isolate the protein from that. But then you need to have the protein inside the bacteria. So you can do that by recombinantly uh, transforming a particular gene or your protein construct inside the bacteria. And that we will do today. We have uh, reconstructed the bacteria and uh, put a small uh, plasmid which contains our gene of uh, or protein gene which express our protein of interest. Otherwise, if you want to uh, isolate a particular uh, protein from a natural source, then your uh, option is quite limited because then you need to grow or um, isolate the particular organ or tissue from where you need to get the protein. So as we are isolating the protein from a bacteria, first what you need to do is uh, express the protein inside the bacterial cell. So for that, what the basic steps are that you grow your bacteria in normal uh, LB or in a for specific need M9 or other minimal media. So first try to do it in a uh, enriched media like Luria Bertoni or LB media. So if when you grow the bacterial cell, there will be a huge number of bacterial cells. Then you need to express the protein. So mostly we follow an IPTG or induction based technique. So there we pro uh, provide IPTG. So I will go through the basic steps how you can express or over express your protein inside the bacterial cell. So first what you need to do, you need to provide, give an overnight culture or around 15 to 16 hours culture in LB media where you grow your cell, bacterial cell mostly E. coli and uh, the vector which you, uh, the strain basically uh, of E. coli will be someone which has a expression system. So we chose BL21 lambda DA3 strain which has this uh, lac uh, operant system where you can express your protein when you provide a particular inducer uh, in our case that is IPTG. So basically you grow your cell overnight then you give a primary inoculum from that particular overnight to a large uh, culture that is suppose 1 liter of LB media and you grow that particular 1 liter media in the next day for um, maybe 4 to 5 hours at 37 degrees centigrade because E. coli mostly grows at 37 degrees centigrade and half life is uh, or the life cycle is around 20 minutes. So when the um, media reaches at particular OD of 0 0.6 to 0 0.8, that time you ha know okay, you have enough bacterial cell when you can induce the particular culture with IPDG and the bacteria will start growing or uh, producing the proteins. Do not put IPDG before that because then you will have uh, end up with limited number of cells and when you put IPDG it is uh, toxic so then the bacteria will stop growing and start producing a protein. So first you need to have enough number of bacterial cell and then after that you can start uh, producing your protein. So when the OD reaches at 0.6 to 0.8, you uh, induce the bacterial cell to IPDG and then again you soon grow your protein for uh, 4 hours to even uh, 18 hours. So this uh, techniques or the timings uh, and the temperature will depend on your protein. So first it is a trial and error uh, based uh, technique. So basically you first do something and then if you are not uh, comfortable or happy with that you change the uh, protocol and so that you get enough number of num enough amount of protein. So what we did is so we have grown our cell in bacteria and when you grow after the induction process we need to collect the cell pellet. So basically we do a centrifugation process and get the cell pellet and the media we, uh, which comes as a supernatant we throw it away. So when you collect the cell pellet it will look something like this. So it is a very small amount of culture around 100 ml. So the uh, cell pellet will be at the bottom of the tube and I have already discarded the media. Uh, so here this is the cell pellet. Now you can keep the cell pellet as it is uh, in um, minus 20 degree or minus 80 degree when and uh, whenever you are comfortable on the next day or some other day when you want to purify the protein you can purify the particular protein from that. Another thing what you can do is you can get the cell pellet and then resuspend the cell pellet in a lysis buffer. 
So, here in this case I have resuspended it in the lysis buffer. So, it has around 1 liter of culture and uh, this pellet I have resuspended in lysis buffer. So, what the lysis buffer contains? So, lysis buffer contains a particular um, is a buffer system. So, obviously it has a particular pH range. So, in our case it is around 0.8. Uh, so, depending on your protein you need to check the pH range because uh, you should not be going closer to the pi of a particular protein. So, at the particular pi the protein will be neutral and it might get precipitated out or coagulate. So, for that uh, you need to check the pH uh, mostly the in our case mama protein is at pH 8.2 it is happy at pH 8.2 because my uh, protein's pi is around 11 or more. So, it is not closer to its pi. So, along with the pH so basically we have this trace and so to um, basically confirm the pH. Uh, so, as I have mentioned that your buffer should have a particular pH. So, in our case we use trees to regulate the pH of this particular solution because trees has a basic pH uh, value. So, the pH is 8.2 along with the uh, trees it has some NaCl uh, salt basically. So, the salt solution is uh, important for a particular protein because if the salt is too uh, low or too high the protein also might uh, get precipitated out. So, you need to have a proper buffer system. So, in our case uh, salt solution is around 200 millimolar. In a cell. Along with that uh, you might have some other uh, ingredients in the buffering system depending on your need uh, um, on your need. So, basically if a protein you are using it if it has a specific need go for a literature survey and see what other people are using for that particular protein and depending on that you can add those things inside it. So, some times people use EDTA uh, so that uh, the, the divalent ions are chelated out and it does not hamper the protein purification. But since we will use FPLC system or a uh, basically a um, uh, column purification with using a nickel NINTA column. So, we do not use EDTA here because then uh, the column it hampers the later purification process inside the column. So, as I mentioned the check the literature and based on your protein you uh, need to ch uh, choose what kind of buffering system you want to use. So, along with this other two important ingredients that we use here is one is protease inhibitor. So, when you lyse the cell all the cell components come out inside uh, from the solution. So, there will be carbohydrates, there will be membranes and there will be other uh, proteins. Also, there will be proteases like uh, different proteases that are inside the cell. So, if the proteases and the proteins are present inside the uh, in a solution the protease might cleave off or chop off the protein of your interest. So, to stop the action of those proteases some people use protease inhibitor as well as EDTA. So, here we are using a protease inhibitor it is named as PMSF. So, PMSF we will use around 2 um, nanomolar concentration. So, I will add some amount of protease inhibitor. So, that whenever I want to isolate my protein or start lysing my cell the proteases will be inactive and it will not chop off my protein. So, when you uh, dissolve this in a lysis buffer if you are doing it in a previous day you can keep this uh, dissolved and keep it in a minus 20 or minus 80 degree centigrade temperature. So, that it freezes out. So, the next day you thaw it and uh, then you start the purification. So, there is a freeze thaw cycle once. So, that also helps in uh, isolating or uh, basically lysing the cells because the proteins are inside the cell. So, you need to break down the cells and to so that the protein comes out in the solution. So, one freeze thaw cycle is good. So, you, it is best that you uh, express the protein then get the pellet dissolve it in uh, lysis buffer and keep it in minus 20 or minus 80 and whenever next day or some other day when you have time you start uh, characterizing or isolating your protein of interest. Now, when you add another this is a vortex machine. So, basically we will vortex it out so that everything is mixed properly and uh, this also helps sometimes in isolating or basically lysing the cells. So, now what we are going through is a lysing procedure before you start lysing you add your protease inhibitor and you also mix it properly. So, what this does is it is kind of a vortex machine it uh, gently or basically vigorously mix the so, uh, solution. So, 
it vigorously mix the solution you can go down the uh, speed as well if you are uh, not um, comfortable with that much of speed sometimes protein might start degrading so depending on your need and your protein's requirement you choose the speed but here as we are um, using the crude extract right now we want to be as a uh, little bit harsh so that's why we are going at a high speed and that this will ensure that my protein is getting mixed up so i have used a vortex machine to uh, properly uh, dissolve the cell pellet whatever the pellet or the cells are there inside the um, solution to mix it up properly also the pmsf or other ingredients that i am putting inside the solution so that it thoroughly mixed so uh, sometimes also we use sodium azide to keep uh, for longer storage so when you are keeping the pellet or the cell suspension in minus 20 or minus 80 for longer period you, there is a chance of uh, fungal contamination because the cells or the medias and the proteins are quite good growth medium for the fungus so then you need to add something which inhibits the growth of fungus and sodium azide is the uh, fungal growth inhibitor it's a toxic uh, substance and it will inhibit such growth and uh, later when you uh, uh, use it or uh, to start isolating or purifying your protein it will not hamper anymore so now if you see the solution so i am here using a pastor paper so it's a plastic pastor paper the solution is quite runny so it's forming a proper drops so it's not viscous or anything so in this case basically the cells are not lysed to help with the lysing uh, procedure of the cells so basically the membrane the cell membrane or the bacteria mem cell membrane has to be lysed and the cell walls so for that we will use something called lysozyme so lysozyme is an enzyme which will hydrolyze the polysaccharide membrane of the bacteria and then all the cellular components of the bacterial cell will come out inside the uh, outside the uh, cells so you can make uh, 10 mg per ml a stock uh, lysozyme solution uh, so lysozyme can be uh, purchased from a company as a powder so it's a uh, lyophilized crystalline powder of lysozyme or you can use the way we are using basically a pinch of lysozyme is enough to uh, hydrolyze all the bacterial cellular membrane so i'm taking a pinch of lysozyme and then i will add that lysozyme to my solution now as it is a powder you need to mix it up properly so again we will use this vortex so vortex will ensure that the uh, lysozyme or anything you provide is mixed up properly and we are going a little bit harsh because now it is only cells uh, that are intact and we need to lyse the cell but if otherwise specified suppose you are using a particular protein or tissue system which does not uh, need or uh, it's not um, required for the harsh treatment you should avoid that now lysozyme acts best at 37 degree centigrade temperature so we will keep it this uh, solution at 37 degree centigrade temperature for uh, 20 to 30 minutes how we will know that it, the lysing uh, has been completed lysis part is completed so that part we will show you later so now we will keep this at 37 degree centigrade to incubate it uh, for the lysis uh, lysis procedure and we will wait and after 20 minutes i will show you what it happened so after 20 to 30 minutes um the lysozyme has been um, inside the solution you will realize that the solution becomes a little bit more viscous so it will try to stick uh, to the uh, to the uh, this append of tube and when you try to do this you will and realize that it becomes a little bit viscous so before that it was uh, kind of liquidy so the viscosity was less so why it becomes viscous 
because after the lysozyme lysis the cells the all the cellular components uh, including the dna and rna comes out from the cell, uh, cell or the nucleus mainly so the dna uh, are highly uh, negatively charged molecule and they are quite large so those uh, dna molecules make a mix the solution uh, a lot of viscous and they try to stick to the um, the wall of this append of tube and that's how you know that the cell has been lysed properly now after the lysis has been done now you need to uh, degrade or basically um, remove the other cellular components so in this procedure you can go for different um, uh, machines or uh, you can choose depending on what kind of cells you are using so basically here we will use a sonicator machine so that generates ultrasonic uh, sound uh, vibrations that will um, basically degrade the cellular membranes and other uh, dna and rnas that are big molecules so other than that if you are using fungus you can use a uh, french press or a different homogenizer or if you are using some kind of tissue system you can use liquid nitrogen or a uh, electric blender system so here we are using uh, ultrasonic uh, some uh, sonicator machine which will create or basically degrade the cellular me uh, membranes and uh, the dna and rna so after the sonication is done you will see the solution becomes again more clear and uh, it the changes a little bit color as well and it becomes again solution or liquid like so this is a sonicator machine so it uh, the sonicator machine basically generates uh, ultrasonic uh, sound vibration and because of those vibration the cellular membranes and uh, the dna rna or the big molecules becomes degraded and after that we will go for a centrifugation so there will be separation of uh, other insoluble fragments and the solution so if your protein is in the solution then can you can easily isolate the protein from the solution or if it is in the cell uh, the insoluble fraction then the uh, steps are different so in a particular sonicator machine basically you have a cell um, basic uh, system where you can choose the pulses and the amplitude at particular which the vibration will occur as well as you have a probe so in this uh, box so this is a uh, basically um, the sound um, proof box this uh, because the it generates uh, ultrasonic sound and you should close the uh, have this in a enclosed uh, sound proof box otherwise it might hamper or it might uh, create a problem for your own ears inside the box there is a metallic uh, probe so this probe uh, you can change it uh, based on your sample uh, requirement so if you have a smaller sample volume like 500 microliter or 1 ml you can change it to a smaller probe and or if you have a larger volume like 100 ml or 200 ml then you can also choose a bigger probe than this so this probe is good for around 5 ml to uh, 50 ml sample so as we have around uh, 10 ml of sample so we are using this uh, medium size probe also this uh, particular uh, machine uh, which has a particular wave uh, sound wave it can generate so this machine's uh, capacity also differs so based on your requirement it might have different machines you can have a smaller one or also a bigger one so now that our cell has been lysed and you can see it become uh, become viscous so we will go for this sonication so before you put the uh, solution uh, for sonication you need to clean the probe of this instrument because people might be using for their own culture and it is uh, a good um, practice to always clean whatever you are using so it is a good practice to always clean the probe before you start using it because other people might have used it and although they have cleaned it after using it there might be some dust particle and other particle which might contaminate your proteins or your solution so uh, first we will clean it with uh, 70% alcohol so this is a metallic probe you can uh, clean it with alcohol as well as water we'll wipe it then uh, we will clean it with deionized water or double autoclave water again wipe it with a tissue paper so now the probe has been cleaned and it is ready to use so there is other uh, in uh, some 
instrument. This is a platform uh, and uh, on the top of which we will keep our sample. So as you can see in our beaker I have taken um, amount of uh, ice. Basically when we use the sonicator when it generates the ultrasonic sound it vibrates and it creates a uh, heat. So a large amount of heat has been uh, will be generated and uh, you don't want your sample to be degraded because proteins are uh, heat labile. So for that purpose we will keep our sample solution inside this ice box. So basically it is inside this ice box so and the probe will go inside this solution. So we will open this cap and it will go inside the solution. So whenever the heat has been is will be generated uh, it will uh, be lost uh, because we are keeping it in the ice. So there will not be too much of heat inside the solution which might degrade our protein. So for that purpose we will put the whole thing here and we will put the platform here. As the sample is at the bottom of this tube we might need to increase the height of this platform so that we can do using this particular lever. So the probe, the uh, tip of the probe must be inside the solution. Now this setup is complete, we will close the door. Always close the door while using the sonicator machine because as I mentioned earlier this door is soundproof. Uh, so it will uh, not um, irritate your ears or other people's. So now we will come back to this particular um, some, uh, instrument. So this generates the uh, pulses and also you can modify the uh, stuff here. So there are times so how long you want to uh, sonicate your sample. There are also pulse. So pulse means the pulse on and off. So basically what we usually do is we go for 15 seconds of pulse. So whatever sonication or vibration it will generate it will be on for 15 seconds. Then we will give a lag period that will be around again 15 seconds. So this lag period the pulse will be off. So it will uh, help the sample to cool down so that uh, so that uh, much heat does not generate. So as we have provided ice, so it will lower the temperature of the sample because when the pulse is on, it will start generating the heat and when the uh, pulse is off, it will stop generating the heat as well as the vibration and the sample uh, get the chance to cool down. Then we go for just a minute. Then we go for amplitude. So in this machine you can go from 35 to 65 percent amplitude. So uh, it is basically how of, uh, much vibration it will generate. We will go for the highest one. So uh, I will start this uh, particular sonication. So the timing and the pulse will depend on a, what kind of tissue or the cells you are using. And uh, the best way to judge is that your solution becomes again uh, liquidy and the viscosity will decrease and also the solution will turn into a pale yellow color so it will change a little bit of color. So it is a trial and error method so you go for it and then if you are not comfortable or happy with it you can change the uh, methods or the protocols here and then so I am starting now. So there will be a uh, buzz noise coming out from this solution. So basically uh, it is generating the vibration right now. So it is on and I have put it for 25 minutes. So it will be on 15 seconds and then it will be off for 15 seconds. Like this um, the sonication will happen in a stepwise manner. And after 25 minutes it will be closed and then we will go for the next step. sonication is done now uh, so it will be stopped uh, by the machine because it is over 25 minutes after that we will take out the sample so at the platform and the sample will be again liquidy so 
After this, we will go for the centrifugation of this particular sample where we will separate the insoluble fractions as well as the solution, uh, soluble fraction. But before we do that, again, we need to follow some good lab practice and we will clean up the probe. So, first we will clean it with normal uh, deionized water. So, the solution uh, gets stick to the probe, it is always good uh, for the long storage of this probe to clean it, otherwise uh, there might be some rust. So, clean it with uh, water first and then with 70 percent alcohol. So, if there is any kind of proteins or other uh, molecules get stuck to the uh, probe, it will be cleaned and there will be no uh, bacterial or fungal growth. So, before and after using this machine, uh, you should always clean up the probe. If there is any kind of spillage, you should always clean it here, close the door and we will switch off the machine. So, now we will go, uh, go for this gross uh, fractionation of our uh, solution. So, I have taken the solution from this tube to this particular uh, tube, uh, falcon tube, because uh, we will go for a high speed uh, centrifugation process and that particular speed is withheld by this particular centrifugation uh, falcon tube or centrifugation tube. So, uh, what it will ensure is that the all big uh, chunk of uh, cell membranes or insoluble fractions will precipitate out from the solution and the, if our protein is soluble uh, in, in the solution, it will come out as a supernatant. So, we will use a uh, big centrifugation uh, uh, centrifuge machine for this and this is a high speed rotor. So, this machine can also, uh, also have basically a low speed uh, rotor also as a high speed rotor. So, this we will switch it on and we will make the speed uh, highest. So, this is 11000 rpm, basically it is 16000 g uh, value and the temperature we have set it at 4 degree centigrade because proteins are mostly stable at uh, low temperature. If you do not require that, you can omit that as well. You can go for 12 degree or lower temperature as well. And the time we will go for let us say 40 minutes. So, another thing we have to make sure is that we have an equal weight of this particular solution, because when we do uh, go, uh, when we go for centrifugation, it is uh, advisable to always have this equal weight at the opposite side. Otherwise, the rotor when the rotor will um, go or the centrifugation will start, it will hamper. There will be weight imbalance, and there might be a chance of uh, accident. So, put the sample and the weight uh, balance basically at the opposite side. So, it should be exactly opposite. close the rotor head. And we will start the centrifugation. If your sample is uh, too much heat sensitive, if you want to do go for a uh, absolutely cold temperature, you should first go for a fast temperature change, we, uh, make the centrifuge at 4 degree centigrade and then you put your sample and go for this uh, centrifugation process. Our protein is not that heat sensitive, so it can withstand to normal temperature like 37 or so on. So, we are not doing that, but if you need, you can do that as well. So, there is a mode for fast temperature. So, basically without your sample, it will go, it will start rotating and make the rotor at 4 degree centigrade. Then you open it and put your sample inside it. There is also short spin, basically if you want to spin down something, you can use that for. And there are multiple uh, program you can set, so the temperature you can monitor, uh, regulate. The program you can set a particular program for multiple use. The speed which can be in RPM, what is the rotational or revolution per minute or the RCF or the G value. So, basically the G value is important because that is the actual force that is uh, that has been generated, that will be generated by the RPM value. 
and then the time uh, so it can go up to minute and second so it can go for one hour or maybe more even that so the centrifugation is running now so after 40 minutes we will um, divide the solution whole solution into a supernatant and into a pellet fraction and uh, we will see what we will do so while the centrifugation is uh, happening we will uh, make the preparation for the next step so in our case uh, our protein is 6x uh, histidine tagged uh, so basically it has 6 consecutive histidine mo molecules at the end terminal of the protein so for that we can uh, easily separate our protein from other uh, residual protein of the cellular components from the cellular components using a NINTA column so this is the uh, NINTA column which has this uh, nickel uh, basically beads that are attached to this NTA or the agarose beads so while the centrifugation is happening, so we will uh, make the preparation for our next step. So in our case, um, our protein is 6x uh, histidine tagged, basically it has uh, 6 consecutive histidine molecules at the end terminal of the protein. So we can easily separate that particular protein from other cellular components or other proteins. So uh, we will use a NINTA column. So basically this column has uh, nickel ions uh, that are attached to this uh, agarose beads and it is packed in a small column. So this is a pre-packed uh, NINTA column that we have purchased and uh, uh, we will use a FPLC system. So, in our, your chromatographic lab as well, uh, we have mentioned. So, so this is basically a fast uh, performance uh, liquid chromatography system. You can attach any kind of column. So, here I am using uh, affinity chromatography column or NINTA, but you can also attach ion exchange column or other different types of column are also compatible. Based on your need, you can attach different types of column. So, as I have mentioned that our protein is 6x histidine tag, we will use this particular NINTA column. So, before you start uh, purification, uh, we need to prepare this particular machine and the tubings and the column um, before we load the sample. So, for that, what we will do is we will uh, basically attach this column in a particular site. So, we will attach this column to the machine. Now, if the column has a particular orientation, always follow that particular orientation which side should be up and which side should be down. So now, uh, as we have mentioned earlier as well in the chromatographic lab that all the tubings and the column are stored at 20 percent ethanol. So that will basically inhibit any kind of bacterial contamination or fungal contamination. So before we start, we need to clean all the tubings and the column with normal deionized water. So for that, I have put the two tubings, so buffer A and B. So in this particular machine, we have two tubes, so buffer A and B, uh, in a uh, particular um, beaker or the uh, container, which has only the deionized water, so milky water we are using. And now, we'll basically run water all through this uh, channels and the column as well. So first we need to clear out any kind of precipitation of the salt or any kind of alcohol that are present um, and get out of the system. So first we will go for the flow and this particular uh, column can withstand 5 ml per minute uh, flow. So always check the columns requirement and do not go um, high uh, column or flow basically it might damage the column uh, as well. So go for this column what kind of column you are using depending on that particular column you change the uh, flow. Basically flow is also dependent on the pressure so basically if you go for a higher flow rate the pressure might increase and it can damage your column. So this column can withstand 5 ml per minute and uh, in case of buffer we are giving mix basically we want buffer A and buffer B both. So we have put the two channel in the same uh, container you can put it in different container but we want to uh, run uh, water through all the channels so basically that's why we have put the buffer a and b in the same container and this container contains uh, only milky water so we'll go for mix so it will take from this two uh, tube it will take both water and then mix it and it will channelize this water through all the uh, tubes so now what we will go is we will run water 
right now what is happening is it's taking water from this tube uh, channel and it is passing through the water from all this channel and it will go uh, to from this uh, it will go through the uh, column as well and everything what is happening we can monitor it in the this lp data view basically it will show what is happening how we can see what is happening basically when the any sample or any solution is passing through this column it will come out from this particular tube and it will go uh, here so this is a uv uh, light chamber so it will measure the absorbance at 280 nanometer so this fps system as i have mentioned earlier as well so this is made for protein uh, purification so all most of the protein which has tryptophan tyrosine residue they absorb at 280 nanometer so it will uh, take the measure absorbance measurement at to 18 nanometer and if any protein particles or any proteins are there it will measure that particular uh, absorbance and then it will come out and uh, this is a conductivity measurement uh, instrument so it will measure the conductance so um, the conductance means how much uh, salt or conductivity is present basically for water it will be low, very low but if you have a high salt concentration of a solution it will show that what is the conductivity of that particular solution so if you are going for uh, suppose ion exchange uh, like cation exchange or anion exchange you can monitor that particular exchange as well so by using this two uh, small instrument it can uh, show what is happening in there so for that what we'll go is record so it will start recording uh, the absorbance as well as the conductivity measurement so right now water is passing and it will clear out uh, any kind of alcohol that are present or any kind of deb, uh, precipitate out so when the last time when someone uses this particular uh, machine there might be some salt precipitation or other components which might be precipitated out inside the uh, tubings as well as uh, might be in the column so it needs to be cleared out properly now another small uh, tips uh, while using this particular um, instrument fps system that while you are using start using it and while you are running water uh, water or anything you might feel that there might be a blockage inside the tubings uh, or the water is not passing as you want like clearly the flow is hampered so then that means either your column has been blocked by different precipitations of other molecules or the tubings also might be clogged so for that you need to clean the machine uh, with uh, proper care so there are uh, instrumentation the uh, cleaning procedures which you need to follow those will be provided by the instrument or the manufacturer which where you have purchased the instrument so always follow that mainly what we do is uh, in our case is that we pass noh and hcl at a proper uh, amount so one molar noh and then water and then one molar hcl and then water so that will clear out any kind of salt precipitation or anything which has been precipitated in the uh, column as well as in the tubings so the cleaning of the column and the machine is different so always uh, make sure what cleaning you are doing so do not uh, so if there is suppose um, hcl has to be passed through your tubings but you cannot pass it through the column so always detach the column beforehand and then uh, clean the fps system and then while you are using the uh, cleaning the column then you can attach the column again and then clean your column as well so you need to wait while the particular uh, this blue and the red line is at the stable position so it will be flat line basically the blue line denotes the absorbance measurement so this is a arbitrary un unit so it does not mean that 0.6 uh, or 1 uh, absorbance at 280 nanometer this is a arbitrary unit and the red line denotes the conductivity measurement so both will be flat uh, before we start running a buffer so uh, first we will run water so it will clear out any uh, anything uh, that might be present in the column or the tube so after we run it um, run the um, water then we will go for this buffer a so buffer a or wash buffer is basically uh, the same buffer in which my protein will be present so in buffer a uh, the trace will be there which has a ph of 8.2 so it will uh, regulate the ph of this particular buffer salt will be there as i have mentioned earlier the proteins are stable at a particular salt uh, salt environment if you have too much of low salt or too high salt the protein might be precipitated out from your solution and if it is precipitated out inside the fps system it might clog up the whole system it might clog up your um, column as well so uh, 200 millimolar salt is present in, in our case if you need you can change the salt solution based on your requirements so you depending on your protein to protein it might vary 
we also have 10 millimolar imidazole inside the wash buffer or buffer A that will ensure that non-specific binding does not happen. So, this particular uh, procedure has been uh, mentioned in the uh, chromatographic lab. So, basically if you have a small amount of imidazole which is another binding partner or ligand for this nickel uh, ions, it will inhibit any kind of non-specific binding. So, a particular other protein might also have histidine moieties which might get uh, bound to this column, but it will hamper and the imidazole will hamper that kind of binding. Since our protein has a long uh, consecutive um, rich uh, histidine tag, it will get bound to the column and other proteins will um, come out from the column. So, if you do not have any histidine tag in your protein or you are, uh, then you have to go for different kinds of methods. There are other methods which you can follow that is ammonium uh, sulphate precipitation or other uh, methods. But here we, as we have histidine uh, tag molecules and that is why we are using this particular method. So, we have been running uh, buffer uh, water basically through this uh, FLC system for the past 10 minutes at a flow rate of 5 ml per minute. So, almost 50 ml of water has been run and in this monitor we can see that the blue and the red line is quite flat. So, that means everything has passed out and nothing is there. So, now we will stop this uh, water and then we will run buffer A. So, basically this will ensure that my column is uh, equilibrated in this particular buffer condition. So, again through all the channels I will pass buffer A. So, buffer A has trace NSAF and 10 millimolar of uh, imidazole. If your protein has a, a cystin residue uh, which is not linked or or single system residue and you want to run a, in a denaturing uh, condition, then you might also add a BME solution that is 1 millimolar to 2 millimolar of BME. Do not add DTT because sometimes DTT hamper this particular NINTA column purification. So, sometimes you need to add BME for if you have a system residue. So, in the buffer you can add that particular BME. Now, we will start running buffer A through all, again through all the column. And uh, again when the uh, blue and the red line becomes stable, we will know that buffer A has been um, passed through this column and it is equilibrated in that particular column. So, as I have mentioned the buffer A has higher salt solution. So, basically the red line will shift because the conductivity will increase and by that we can actually measure uh, if the buffer A has been passed or not. So, the blue line will also shift because imidazole also have some absorbance value at 280 nanometer because of this uh, imidazole ring. So, when this blue line and the red line will shift up, it will have a higher absorbance and higher conductivity and it then again it will become flat, then only we will stop the running of the buffer A. Now, after this buffer A has been run, then our column has been equilibrated in the buffer A solution and it is ready for the loading of the sample. In the meantime, the centrifugation will be over and we will separate out the uh, supernatant and the uh, insoluble pellet fraction and then we will run the soluble fraction through this column. So, our centrifugation has been done and you can clearly see there is the supernatant and the pellet fraction. So, right now after the centrifugation is over, we will separate the solution fraction, this will decant the solution fraction. So, this is the pellet fraction, so this is insoluble uh, fraction and this is the soluble protein fraction. So, at this particular stage what you can do is if you are not confident where your protein uh, might be sometimes in case of E. coli big due to this folding problem uh, the pro your protein might be uh, inside this uh, insoluble pellet fraction. So, basically it means that your protein is in the inclusion bodies uh, it does not fold properly it goes in the inclusion bodies or uh, so, in that case what you can do after running after running this centrifugation, you can take some small amount of sample from here and small amount of sample from here and then run a SDS paid gel. So, that will show you that where your uh, protein of interest is present. So, if it is present in the solution fraction then it is easy. So, you just run the solution fraction from uh, through this column. 
but if your protein is inside this uh, insoluble fraction or inclusion body then you need to again dissolve this inclusion body or insoluble fraction in a particular denaturing condition so basically you have to put a uh, 6 molar guanidium hydrochloride or uh, urea solution so that this becomes soluble and then you purify your protein and then you have to go for refolding of your protein. So, if you do not want to do uh, those kind of uh, exper steps basically if you want to avoid those uh, refolding steps because it might be that your refolding is not proper. So, protein needs to have a proper folded structure uh, and it should be the native structure. If you might uh, if you want to avoid those kind of structure then you might need to change the expression uh, timing or the temperature so that your protein comes uh, under the solution fraction then you can avoid that kind of uh, situation. So, we know that our protein comes in the solution fraction so that is why we are running uh, this solution fraction through this column. But if you are not confident at this particular stage you can run both the uh, system the supernatant as well as the um, in, uh, insoluble fraction through SDS page and then when you are uh, con confirm that uh, when you confirm that your protein is present in a, either of the fraction then you run that particular stage. So, now I have taken this supernatant solution, but uh, I cannot load this particular solution right uh, now to the column. So, first this has been shown before as well, I need to pass through this whole supernatant solution through a filter, this is 0.22 micron filter. So, that will ensure that any kind of cellular debris that might be present in the solution, uh, big particles would not clog up. Uh, will not clog up my uh, column. So, I will take a syringe and I will take the whole solution in that particular syringe, be very careful with the needle, try to avoid making any bubble. So, now my protein is inside the syringe, I will remove this uh, needle and this is a 0.22 micron uh, syringe filter. So, you can attach this filter to this particular syringe like this. So, this has this filter membrane and in a clean tube you just take that Super. So, basically it will filter out any kind of particulate matter that are beyond 0.22 micron. So, this will ensure a longer storage or a longer uh, lifetime for your column. Do not load any crude sample just right away to the column. Now, this is our filtered uh, solution and we will run uh, pass uh, this solution to the column. So, you can use this kind of filter just once, so discard after using it. Now, if we go into this particular FPLC system, you can see that the blue and the red line has gone up. So, basically the conductivity has increased because our buffer A has uh, 200 millimolar sodium salt before it was just normal water. So, uh, this means and these two are in flat line this means uh, our column has been equilibrated in the buffer A solution. We will stop it here and then we will load our solution. So, this is the uh, syringe uh, fill that means it has a mark of syringe. So, basically now you can here in this particular channel you can load your sample. So, before loading I will take my sample in this syringe again. So, 
this is the filtered sample. If you have any kind of uh, bubbles, try to remove the bubbles. Now, our solution is in that particular syringe and as you can see there is a marking and there, there is a two sided arrow here. So, in it, before you start loading your sample, I will remove this empty syringe, put the syringe which contains my sample and then twist this side. So, this means I can load now. So, this uh, will ensure that my sample is inside the sample tube. So, this sample tube contain, uh, has a volume of 10 ml. So, at a go I can uh, load 10 ml of sample. So, uh, right now I have around 8 to 9 ml. So, I can uh, go for the full sample loading. So, I will just load the whole thing. So, gently start pushing this uh, syringe. As I have less than 10 ml of sample, I can load at a one go. If you have higher volume, just load 10 ml, then wet, then twist this thing again back to its original position. So, now the channel is linked with this uh, buffer system. Run buffer A and then after some time, you again twist it and load another 10 ml of sample. So, now what I will do is, I will flow, uh, start running the buffer A sol solution and simultaneously I will start recording. So, then buffer A will run and come and it will push the whole sample uh, inside the, which is present inside the sample tube to this column. So, the it will go uh, to the column then it will come out. So, anything uh, that is uh, that does not have this uh, histidine tag or moiety it will come out because it cannot bind uh, cannot bind to the nickel um, bits and uh, the whole uh, thing will come out and uh, the absorbance will be measured and at 280 nanometers so other proteins you can see that it is coming out your protein because our protein has success histidine intact it will get uh, stuck to the column and uh, so there will be a huge up uh, increase in the absorbance as well as uh, absorbance uh, monitor and then it will again go down so when it goes down and become stable then you know that you can start uh, running a uh, program where buffer A and buffer B will be run. So, then buffer B which has a higher uh, amount of imidazole will compete with your uh, our protein of interest and it will displace our protein from the column and then at the elution fraction our column is come uh, will uh, our uh, protein will come out. So, right now what will happen is other protein will come out from this uh, column so, that is also called wash. So, basically you are right now we are washing our column through this wash uh, by using this wash buffer. So, if you are doing it for the first time uh, save the uh, like take the wash uh, solution and keep it separately and while running an SDS page also run the uh, wash solution because you need to ensure that your protein is not coming out uh, at this point of stage. Uh, it should be there inside the solution. So, you should see um, that there is no protein uh, your protein will not be present at the wash buffer. So, other proteins will be there, but your protein will be absent. So, always save the washing um, solutions, wash solutions in a separate container and then when you have a elutent fraction as well, you go and run the uh, elutent uh, solution through an SDS page to see where your protein is present. So, right now what will happen is this blue line will go up because uh, the wash buffer is actually uh, pushing the solution or the uh, supernatant solution which we have uh, collected through this column and it has come out from the column and go went uh, pass through this uh, UV monitor. So, you can see it is the blue line is going up that means all the other proteins that are present inside this particular supernatant will is coming out of the solution uh, of the column because uh, if whatever is coming out from the column is not bound to the column because if it is bound then it will not come out in the wash buffer because uh, wash buffer ha only has trace SCL uh, NACL and uh, 10 millimolar of imidazole it cannot compete with 6 histidine tag. 
some non specific binders and other proteins will come out from this column and it is getting monitored here in the blue line. So, blue line is going up that means all the other proteins contaminant proteins that are present in the solution is coming out. So, you should also save as I mentioned that save this particular um, collection in a different tube and while you run an SDS page you should check if your protein is there or not. If your protein is in the now in the wash solution that means the either the histag has been chopped off by the other proteases or your might protein might be getting degraded and that is why your protein is um, coming out in the wash solution. If that happens then you need to change or modify the purification protocols the steps uh, which you are following uh, otherwise you will not get a uh, pure protein because in the wash solution other uh, contaminant proteins are also present that are bacterial proteins. So, now it is coming out, so it is taking some time after it comes down then only we can start eluting our protein from the column. So, now the program has been stopped, so it is uh, it has been run for 30 minutes and you can see in this particular chart is that uh, there is a peak here at the blue line denotes the absorbance at 280 nanometer because the protein that were bound inside the column uh, has come out at this particular stage. So, it is around 40 percent of buffer B. So, 40 percent of buffer B that means around 200 to 250 uh, millimolar of imidazole. Uh, so, as I mentioned 6, six, histidine, six consecutive histidine molecules need around 200 to 50 uh, millimolar of imidazole to come out from the uh, nickel beads. So, this thing corresponds to this our protein of interest. Uh, so, basically we are hoping that our protein is present in this particular peak and if you zoom into it you can see there are the small uh, green flags are basically uh, denotes the fraction number. So, here you can see at this particular peak hump uh, the fraction number 18 to 23 is there here. So, now our job is to collect this particular fractions and then run from this particular fraction run a, a small amount of uh, sample to this SDS page to see what is the purity of our protein. And also we have to concentrate our protein and check what is the actual concentration or amount of protein that are present. So, basically in one or two fraction we will have around 2.5 ml of sample like this and we will take suppose 10 microliter or 20 microliter of sample and then run through SDS page to check the quality or the purity of our uh, sample. So, if there is another uh, protein contaminant that is present, uh, so you know your molecular, uh, the molecular weight of your protein. So, suppose it is a 15 kilodalton protein and you also see something at 20 kilodalton or uh, 7 kilodalton or suppose 50 kilodalton that means that is an impure uh, contaminant that has been that is present inside your solution. So, then again you have to go for another round of um, purification procedure. Suppose if it is uh, too much variation in the molecular weight you can go for size exclusion chromatography or suppose you have a particular uh, affinity tag or other ion exchange uh, something like that you have to go for that to pure, uh, get a pure protein. So, if you have a pure protein right away because uh, mostly in case of uh, NIHA column purification or uh, INAC purification it is quite uh, pure and you do not need to go for any other uh, purification protocol. So, if you have that then you can uh, go for this uh, concentration and check the um, concentrate in your sample. So, how we will concentrate your sample? So, here we have a device so which is called a centricon. So, basically what this device do is, so it looks like a falcon tube like uh, the centrifuge tube which we have been using previously like this. So, but it has two uh, things. So, along with this falcon tube it has a small holder like this and this you can see there is a white patch. So, these are the membrane. So, this has a cut off of 3000 uh, molecule So, basically what it does is, so you can see there is written 3000 MC, uh, MWC or so molecular weight cut off. So, this particular membrane will uh, let out anything that is uh, below 3 uh, kilo Dalton. So, basically any small molecules or protein that are below say, uh, 3 kilo Dalton will come out from this uh, membrane. 
So basically you pour your sample here so in this particular holder and then when we, while you do centrifugation, so through this centrifugal force uh, the other small molecules will come out, so the buffer will also come out and it will be uh, stored in this particular falcon, so it goes like this, so when you rotate uh, the sample it will come out and it will be stored here. As my protein is around 15 kilodalton, it will be uh, remain here inside this particular hole. So, using this particular, uh, this type of centricon instrument, what you can ensure is that you can concentrate your sample uh, to your certain volume. Suppose here it is marked as well. So, this is around 15 ml, it can hold 15 ml of sample. So, you can go, uh, so from 15 ml, you can go for 1 ml or so. And also, it will ensure if any small contaminants are present, any degraded uh, proteins are present, that will also come out because it has a cutoff. If you are using suppose 25 kilodalton protein or 50 kilodalton protein, then you can have a higher molecular weight cutoff, suppose 10 kilodalton cutoff or so. So then anything below 10 kilodalton will come out from this particular holder. So you should use a particular cutoff which is has a lower range in the uh, than your protein uh, molecule protein molecular weight. So suppose you have a 15 kilodalton protein, you should not use a cutoff of 12 or uh, so. You should use a 3 kilodalton because it might uh, there might be a chance that your protein also come out from this holder. So by using this kind of uh, machine or uh, and the small this kind of small instrument and also a centrifuge machine, we can concentrate our samples and then we can check its purity and the uh, quantity of that particular solution. So, till now I have been mentioning that how you can check the quantity. So, basically you can uh, go for absorbance at 280 nanometer. Most protein have this tryptophan and tyrosine residues inside the peptide chain and it absorbs at 280 nanometer. But if your protein does not have uh, such a uh, tryptophan tyrosine residues, then you have to go for other methods to uh, quantify the amount. Basically, you can go for this gel uh, estimation. So, you run a gel and then through the gel uh, band intensity, you can estimate how much protein you have. And also another important part of this purification procedure is that you need to devise a uh, assay system to check what, uh, how much protein or how pure your protein is. So, by uh, or how much active your protein is. As we are going through different kind of steps and it might be harsh for the protein, your protein might be degraded or your protein might get unfolded. If the folding is not pro proper, then the function of that particular protein will be hampered. So, for a, your protein, you need to devise a particular assay system. So, suppose your protein is an en enzyme, then you have to have the substrate and check the enzymatic activity of your protein after you purify like this. Or suppose your protein binds to a certain particular molecule, then you have to go for this binding assay as well and you can check the uh, folding in by different uh, techniques like you can do NMR, you can go for CD to see how folded your protein is and if your hampering is folding or not. So, if you hamper the folding or if your enzyme does not show uh, enough enzymatic activity, then you have to change the purification protocol so that you do not use that kind of environment where your protein is getting hampered, uh, function is getting hampered. So, suppose your protein is get not being active, then you have to probably do all this system at the cold temperature. So, might your protein might be very heat sensitive. So, you should be uh, using a cold room where the temperature is 4 degrees uh, low and then you have to go for this FPLC run or centrifugation at 4 degree temperature. My protein is uh, not that heat sensitive, that is why I am using it in a uh, outer environment where the temperature is around 25 degree. But if your protein is heat labile, then you have to go for a cold room. Also, uh, you might need to change the buffer composition as well depending on the proteins. As I mentioned earlier as well, that uh, depending what kind of protein you are using, you need to add those kind of small molecules or to stabilize your protein. So, the buffer system should be like that, uh, so that your protein will be as stable as possible in the solution. Otherwise, your protein will precipitate it out and you will not get a pure protein or you might not be able to purify that protein from the tissue or the source. So, the as I mentioned again earlier that this particular purification of your protein is not like DNA purification. So, it is not a um, straightforward uh, protocol which you can follow. So, it is a trial and error based method, you have to do something then if you are not happy with the uh, result you have to change uh, make some modification in the protocol then again redo the whole thing. So, it takes some time to standardize a particular purification protocol for a particular protein. So, it will vary depending on what kind of protein you are using, what kind of expression system you are using. Sometimes it might happen that if your protein is going into the inclusion body, so 
I have mentioned that uh, in the after centrifugation you are getting uh, our protein is getting in the solution fraction and there is a one part which is insoluble inclusion body and that is unfolded basically. So, if your protein is going inside the inclusion body then during expression uh, so as I mentioned the E. coli expires at 37 degrees centigrade, but during expression if you lower down the temperature to suppose 16 degree or 20 degree it might not go to the inclusion body it might be inside the solution. So, like this you have to modify the whole protocol to based on your requirement and see what is best for your protein. So, right now what our uh, job is to run the SDS page. So, SDS page through SDS running the uh, SDS uh, gel electrophoresis we can see what is the purity of our protein. So, we will take small amount of this fraction or we can concentrate it down and take this particular solution and then we will run through SDS page to check uh, if other contaminant proteins are there or not. So, for 15 percent, uh, so we will run probably 12 percent or 15 percent SDS page and also we will check the quantity of the protein. So, how much protein we have uh, by using a nano drop. So, we will basically uh, check the measurement uh, absorbance at a 280 nanometer and uh, if you know the molecular extension coefficient of a protein you can actually um, measure the amount that is present uh, amount that is present inside the solution by uh, you if you know the extension coefficient as well as the absorbance of that particular protein. So, by this way you can actually estimate how much protein you have and what is the purity of your protein. If your protein is not pure then you have to go for another uh, purification step. If it is pure then uh, you can uh, do the enzymatic activity or any kind of biochemical assay system which you have devised for your protein and see what is the functional. So, if you have to check the purity the amount and you have to go for the some kind of assay to ensure that whatever protein you are uh, trying to get is pure and it is functional.